All right, Debbie, we're getting ready to go. We're going to read the first few words in Galatians 5, chap yeah, chapter 5, verse 22. And we're going to be talking about love. But the fruit of the Spirit, and I love what the Amplified says, the result of His presence within us is love. So we're going to talk about love. <clears throat> you can, now that I got you there for like two seconds, you can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is where we're going to be 99% of the rest of the time. Because we're going to talk about love. I just Since I said we were going to do fruit of the Spirit, we'll go there and we'll pick one of the words and then we'll jump around. Um, 1 Corinthians 13. The love chapter. That's what. That's how we're going to figure out what love is. And I, I got reaffirmed just this morning about last week when we said, if 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 we are Christian and we are, and our fellow believers are Christians and they are, and you have a good relationship with them, we should have the right or the responsibility, depending if the Holy Spirit checks you but at least the right to go to a fellow believer and say, is that Christ-like? But if we don't know what Christ-like is, how do we know that unless the Holy Spirit checks us in the moment? And that's the fine line. But, especially if we have a good relationship with that person, we should be able to go to them without them getting mad and go, time out. Like I said last week, time out. Is this Holy Spirit inspired? Is this Christ-like? And we're just going to be talking about love. We're, we're going through the list of the fruit of the Spirit. So next week we'll do one or at least, if not more, depending on how the Holy Spirit leads me. But we're going to talk about love a lot today. Uh, we talked about Judas seed last week where the enemy will try to plant flesh into us, world into us, and all the negative that he can get into us. And we as Christians should at some point be able to go time out. Is, is this Christ-like? Is this what Christ would do? And have the, have the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to do it because like we said last week, it isn't every time that we should in the middle of a conversation go time out, but there's times we should. And, but then there's other times where we should wait a week and go, hey, can I talk to you about this situation? But it's got to be Holy Spirit-led. Because if we do it, if, if we do it out of our flesh, we done the same thing they did, just in a different way. You know, because now we're what everybody says, the Bible thumper. But if the Holy Spirit leads us to do it, we're not a Bible thumper. We're doing what the Spirit wants us to do, and it's Spirit led. So, love. Uh, before we, I'll just give you a definition that this is using: unselfish concern for others. Is a cool, cool definition. And another definition that it's using is sacrificial. Unmerited deeds to help a needy person. That's pretty cool. That's the definition that the contributors to this book got from the ancient writings. But I don't want to know what an ancient writer wrote. I want to know what God says. So when I was thinking about it, how, how, how do we know what love is? Let's find out what God says. Because you got to remember, there's two scriptures that God talks about. First, I believe it's in 1 John somewhere, he says, God is love. So if God is love, we should be love. The second one is, the world will know us by our love. So you're in a conversation, someone goes berserk, Time out. The world's looking at us. In this moment, you've earned, you have the right, you know you have the right. You either have a good relationship and the relationship will handle the, the, the conflict or the Holy Spirit's inspired you to interact with this person at that moment. Time out. Your lost neighbors watching us talk right now, do they see love in this interaction? And I think... I think the world needs more of that. I think Christians need more of that. I think at times I need more of that. Because we're not doing it at a selfish desire. You need to look more like Christ. We're doing it out of love. And I think that's why God put that first. Because God, and we talked about in Proverbs, discipline. Don't be afraid of discipline. 
He disciplines us so that we will be a better representation of love since we're talking about love to the world. So if He's constantly tweaking us and the Spirit lives in us, we can't be afraid at times when, when God wants to use the Spirit through us to tweak and prune others. And like we talked about last week, we have to be so in tune with the Father that when we're way across the pasture and all the other sheep are ba ba ba, and, and Jesus goes, come back. We know that's his voice and he whispered it, but we heard it through all the turmoil. Yes, come back. So we have our own spot we got to take care of. But at times we've got to help our brothers and sisters rise up. So let's look at love. And, and what I love about Corinthians is I was looking at it a little bit. It was like Corinthians chapter 12 is talking about the gifts. Your gifts. Then he jumps to love. And then he talks about prophecy as the superior gift. So he sandwiches love in between you doing what God's called you to do. Let that be the driving force. If I'm concerned about my brother's spiritual welfare in love, I will check them. Especially if the Holy Spirit tells me to do it. But there's times he may delay it. He may hold it back and say, call him in a week or two, write him a note in a week or two, whatever. But there's times he may just, you have a solid enough relationship with them especially if you're family real family then you can just say time out son is this the way you should act in Christ daughter is this the way you should act in Christ when you guys husbands were sorry is this the way you would act in Christ husband is this the way you would act wife you know you know best friend is this the way you act and then when you're out in the world and that acquaintance comes up and they say they're Christians now you've got to listen to the Holy Spirit a little bit because maybe we just meet once a week and we have a couple hours on Sunday and you know, who are you? You know, our flesh, our flesh, let's put it, their flesh can get more in the way than the Spirit trying to work on them unless the Spirit told us to do it. So be careful of that. All right, we're going to go through and see how far we can get about the love, how Christ tells us what love is through Paul and, for, and 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And he starts, he kind of ties everything together. Remember, there was no numbers, no chapters when he wrote these. So he's tying up. He's going to start with prophecy. We're going to keep running until he says love. Verse 1. If I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but have not love for others growing out of God's love for me, then I have become only a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal, just an annoying distraction. If I have the gift of prophecy and speak a new message from God to the people and understand all the mysteries and, and possess all the knowledge and if I have all sufficient faith so that I can move, remove mountains but do not have love reaching out to others, I'm nothing. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, if I surrender my body to be burned but do not have love, it does me no good at all. Wow. So, Reverse digest that. If God's telling us, if we are serving Him, but we don't have love for others, it's a service of flesh. But break that down to reverse it to where the enemy's going. I don't care if you serve. I don't care if you go to church. I don't care if you quote pray. I don't care if you read your Bible. I don't care if you do anything. But if, if the enemy can just keep us going through the motions and keep us busy with church he's got the, the, the seeds within us that he can go anytime I want to hook them I can because they don't understand love when we go out in a couple weeks to serve the community are we serving the community because pastor told us to go and do whatever do some landscaping hand out some food hand out some cards gas if we get that you know or are we going out there and like I said many weeks ago are we prayed up that Lord yes I want conversation after conversation for you but Lord you send someone my way it's in my path that will interact with me and then I can interact with them that you want 
to be touched for you. That's love. Why are we why are we buying down gas to show the love of Christ because we love that person that one person numbers should not mean anything to anybody I mean it felt great when there was 12 of us sitting in here but it doesn't matter there's four of us in here right now God wants something for us and we've got to have that mentality whether there's three people in a church service or there's 3,000, it should not matter. God loves each and every one of us and He's given that person that's in front of you a message from God when they listen. And that makes a big difference. Makes a huge difference. And now He's going to start breaking it down. Love endures with patience. Well, golly, now love is telling me i got to be patient. Fail. So there's Judas seeds. The enemy likes to throw that hook in there. Well, if I could get you to be impatient. Even if it's the right thing. Even if it's the right thing. See, that's the challenge of love. If I'm not 100% sure to check you, I can't do it. Because I don't want to check you. I want God to check you. And if I know the Holy Spirit because I know His voice tells me to check you, then I do it. It's the same way when I'm doing a Bible lesson. I'm like, Lord, I don't want to say that. They don't want to nope, know. That's, that's tough. And He's like, you say what i got to say. Now they've got to process it the way they need to process it. If they get mad at you, then they're not getting mad at you. They're getting mad at God. And I'm like, well, that's fair enough. And that's That's tough. Because as, a, as a, the person that's speaking or even as a pastor or a leader of a ministry, you don't want to offend anybody. But when God checks us, doesn't that offend us sometimes? We're not patient with His love. How are we going to be patient with other people's love? We're not patient ourselves, so we're sharing that love. Patience sometimes is waiting for them to come back. You know, you've, you saved a wild animal and raised it up to health and you love that wild animal, but that wild animal is not supposed to be domestic. It's supposed to be out in the wild. And the old antage is, if I let this wild animal go and it comes back, now it's mine. That's tough. Can you imagine having a ministry of thousands of people and, and in one second you call the word of God and all of a sudden 900 of them split? The, the emotional... The stress, the human stress. Now, the, the thing we got we forget is we forget the spiritual stress that that leader goes under because God called him to shepherd those people. And sometimes God asks us to say things that people don't like because they're not being patient with us or with God and be like, why'd you say that? Because scripture said that we need to endure with patience because that's love. And that's those checking moments. Um, you being very patient at this moment? This is a flesh reaction that the enemy's planting seeds in you. I love you. I don't want I don't want those seeds to boil and destroy your walk with God and take your peace and your joy. And, and, and I don't want it to get to the point where the, the enemy has such a stronghold that possibly he can get you to renounce your salvation. That's a tragedy. But at the same time, I love you so much, I don't want you to go through life being miserable and depressed and, and, and angry and just make it in, in the gates of heaven with the skin of your teeth because you did say that you love Jesus one day. But you were miserable for 50 years as you walk this earth because you wasn't patient. When, when we have a prayer, love is patient. God, I love you no matter what, and I'm patient and waiting for this answer. Whew. That's hard. That's very hard, especially when it's a, a now thing. Because he's all knowing. We see now. We, we're thinking, you know, if I don't get this now, if I if you don't touch me here now, if you don't do this now, you, you know. And how many people throughout the world go, God doesn't love me. Look at what's happening in my life. They're not patient with God. They've never been taught that love is patient. 
So we've got to be patient with ourselves. We've got to be patient with others. We've got to be patient with God. And that's hard. He goes on. Love endures with patience and serenity. That's tough. Did you say something else than serenity? Mine just says love is patient, love is kind. Kind. Serenity is kind. It's hard to be kind when someone is being mean, isn't it? <laughs> and being mean is lightly. They're screaming at you, hollering at you, calling you everything in your world. Like, where did that come from? But on the context of us checking each other with love. It's okay, I'm patient with you to let you ream me out right now. I don't like it. But I have to make sure Holy Spirit keep me in check. Help me be patient. Help me respond in kindness, not in anger, so that those Judas seeds that we talked about, so the enemy can't plant seeds of whatever in us. Wow. Yeah. Not just that, but especially if it's if it's patience that the person's struggling with, and they're jumping all over us, and we jump back all over them. We haven't shown them the right way either. Mm -hmm. We've just reinforced. We, just with it. we reinforced their behavior. And see, if we are supposed to be the light and the salt of the world, we have to give the, op the, the Holy Spirit opportunities to convict those people when they go back home and they're thinking, over, I don't know why Ivan didn't respond this way and why Ivan didn't respond that way. We have to give them the opportunity to, for the Holy Spirit to go. Well, maybe Mary being kind and patient and letting you absorb was the way you should re act and not the way you did you reacted wrong maybe you need to repent to the father and maybe you need to go apologize because we set the light we are the salt the light is the example the salt sometimes we got to throw on the wounds and you all know what happens when you've been cooking and you get a salt and you that little snick on your finger it's like a paper cut all over the teeniest things hurt the most and that's love and the way we react is love. And he goes on. And he says, and he says, the love endures with patience and serenity. Love is kind. We talked about that. And thoughtful. Love is thoughtful. So, love is thoughtful. That means I have to have thought in my love. So, and love is an action. So, if I am thoughtful, that means sometimes I have to pause. Sometimes we have to remove ourselves from situations because we're not, the interaction is not being thoughtful. It's being reactive. And for love, we need to be thoughtful in our response. Uh, you all were married, so I'm sure it's happened. There's probably times in the marriage where it was a response and it wasn't a thoughtful reaction. And that raised the temperature of the room a little bit. Because it was a response. It wasn't thoughtful. So if I love a person and they love me, sometimes I have to remove myself from that situation and go, time out. Yeah, that's when my husband would go out and shop. Yeah. For a while. And yeah. And come in and she should believe yeah. yeah. And then we'd be fine. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and, if they're being led by the Holy Spirit, they'll go, okay, I'll come back. You know, in the marriage, whatever the context was, going to the shop and staying out there and coming back and discussing it in, in, a, in a thoughtful way, in a peaceful way. But in, in an everyday interaction, it's time out. Call me later. Call me when you're ready to talk. Or, or I need an hour or two. Call me in an hour or two or I'll call you and we can talk about this. And that's Holy Spirit led. That's love. Because love is doing nothing if we're just sitting here butting heads. We've all done it. Well, you know, the most um, actual um, example of that is Charles Stanley and mm -hmm. what he went through. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you got to see you know, the narrative about him. Right. It was a whole hour. But when people lashed out at him mm -hmm. and carried on mm -hmm. and 
just took it. Yeah. And that's that's what we gotta do. Uh, I remember a situation. I did something a lot of people didn't like. It was right because I was following the Holy Spirit. They wanted something different in a natural way. And I said something. I, I told the leader that, okay, I agree with what you're going to do. I'll, I'll step down even though you're firing me technically. And so we have, we have the, the, the leader meeting calling me in to fleshly read me out because it was, it was heated when I came in. And, and I'm sitting there and the leader starts going through the list. We didn't like this. We don't like this. We don't like this. We don't like this. And I'm like, okay, okay, okay. And I just look at him and I didn't try to explain myself. And for whatever reason, before I went in and prayed, everything came to my mind was Jesus never said a word to defend himself. Never. They were whipping him. They beat him. They crucified him. And he never said a word to defend himself. Because he knew he was right. And he didn't have to defend himself. Because it wasn't going to matter. The people already made their mind up. They were already going to crucify him. And I'm just sitting there. And I, I was at such peace, it drove them nuts. Every one of them. Going, they were getting mad and driving nuts. And I'm sitting there. So the leader gives me this list of things. And he said, what do you think we ought to do? I think you ought to remove me. Because I told you no. And the atmosphere changed. How can they still be mad at me? I agreed with them. Not principally that they were right for what they did. But I gave them their out. Because I knew principally the ministry couldn't keep going because the same thing was going to keep happening because of everybody doing flesh. We don't like this so we're going to go complain and then that just makes the whole thing. So I was like... I told you no, because I stood my ground. and says, God told me to do it, and I did. But they, by the end of the meeting, they're like, will you help us? <laughs> I'm like, there's no bad. I'm thinking to myself, eh, no. <laughs> I'll help you. <laughs> I'll help you. And I, I, I went and helped for a little while, but then after that, it was like, God says, uh, you're done here. You need to move on. I'm like, okay. And you know, they got mad because I left. <laughs> Thought you love these kids. I'm like, I do. But the way we react and interact as adults is teaching these kids nothing about Christ. And it was just fascinating. You know, the way we interact with others is fascinating. It wasn't easy because I knew the spiritual growth of the kids and the adults that were there was no longer going to happen. And it just fell apart after that, after we left. And to this day, I grieve what would happen with these young adults that was helping. Where would their spiritual growth now be? Where is the kids of the people that were squawking and squabbling that came to me years later and go, we should have listened to you. Our kid was the trouble. Like, yeah. And I never, I just think in my mind, I'm going, yeah, you're right. But you didn't. You didn't like the idea that we were going to have a hardcore Bible study and only few kids are coming not the whole thing and your kid didn't get invited because they didn't want to do it they wanted to be there and be the trouble and how many interactions have we had in everyday life how we respond really sets people off and if I'm if I'm letting the Holy Spirit lead me and they're letting the enemy lead them, they're going to get madder. But we have to be patient with God and say, God, you take this situation. Now, I go home and I pray over the situation. Lord, you need to change that attitude. You need to change that place. And is it my place to make a contact to check them as fellow believers? And it is a fascinating thing. He goes on and thoughtful and is not jealous or envious. It's fascinating how people can get jealous so easy. 
or they envy and don't even know it. I mean, I've, I've heard it in my travels over the years in the ministries that I've done. Well, you got more adults in your youth ministry than I do in my, my adult ministry. Why? I don't know. All I do is I, 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 I you want to help with the kids' ministry? I need some more bodies. And most of the time the people would go, I don't know what to do. I said, all you got to do is come sit in a chair. And then by the time, as we get through it, they're great leaders for the kids. But I heard the jealousy. I heard the envy in the, in, in the other person's voice. You got more in yours than I got in mine. What's up with that? Maybe I'm saying what God wants me to say, whether they like it or not, and God's working in them, and that's what they want. They don't want fluff. There's actual change that happens when we listen to the Holy Spirit and say and do what He wants. And I don't know the situation of these other people. I have assumptions, but I, that's not me. The Holy Spirit's never told me anything. So it's like, I don't know. Are you going through the motions of what this is supposed to be? Or are you listening to the Holy Spirit to say tough things when tough things are said? And just using Scripture? Or are you going, I think this is what Scripture says. It's tough. Jealousy and envy gets in the way. The boss has this or the boss has that and how we interact in our jobs. Well, this person got the best whatever and this person got the better whatever. This person's doing this or this one's doing that. Is that patient with God? That's tough. Lord, they're making X amount of dollars more than me and they ain't even been here as long as me. What's going on? Do I been giving it to God? That's tough. It's tough. Are we patient with God? Love does not brag. That's a tough one, isn't it? How do we... What's the, what's the fine line between being healthy, a healthy pride in what you do for God or for your boss or in your family? Where, where's that, that line that's... This is pleasing and I know it and I want to share with everyone else the goodness that God's doing. And where's that line between sharing the blessings of God and bragging. Do you know what the line is? When it's about yourself. When, when I say I. Now I, I get in trouble because of the way I speak. Because I, I, I'm not fat. I don't know what it is. I'm not fast enough to say God did this. My natural speaking is well, this happened and that happened and that happened. So you may hear bragging. But the Holy Spirit's never checked me on bragging. But usually there's a tone that goes with it. And so I've tried to ch I try to stop that when I talk about things God's done through me. And especially I'm very try to be careful in who I'm talking about it with because I don't want Judas seeds to be planted in their life and the enemy to have seeds planted in their life where he's bragging. And I've had a bunch of people do that in in past. It's like, who do you think you are? And I'm like, I'm nothing, but I know what God does through me. And I know how God uses me and God does. And I said, you know, when I have a conversation with someone, I try to be conscious of that, and I'm not always, and I know I don't do it in here all the time. It's like, God, I said, I, sometimes I'll say, look what, look what we did, or I did for God, but yet the heart is, God did it through me. That's bragging when we take credit for it. I don't take credit for nothing. I'm nothing. God's done some amazing things through, through my life. God's done some amazing things this week. And, and, and 
I have no I have no vehicle to ride in right now. It's fascinating to me. I was telling telling someone that I was telling Roger this the other he called on the phone and I said and I told him in prayer group too. I said you know I said every time I start to make headway and and the sale starts doing good and I start to make some extra you know set aside money to have a little nest egg or whatever you want to call it. The enemy always causes disruption. Well, I can't be consistent because of weather. I can't be consistent because I couldn't go. I can't be consistent because the truck didn't work. I'm getting ahead. And, you know, you need the one or two sale days out of the three that you can go in a week. And eBay needs to do okay to make the whole thing work. So eBay would do good and the sale's terrible. You know, or I can't get to the sale, so I can't be consistent to be able to go buy other stuff so you can keep the circle going. And I told Roger, I was like, the enemy's working pretty hard right now. That's because I was I was soaring. And you know, and I, I'm not having big sales on eBay. But God's fed me all week. Just by the stuff I've had listed for months. You know. And then I was telling Chris, I said, I've sold more stuff in this last week, number-wise, not dollar-wise, than I have in a long time. God has never let me down. He's always fed me, my animals, and I had to feed my aunt this week. So he's always fed us. I took the extra I had and like bought groceries for her. So it was like, this is cool. God's never let me down. So I'm not, and I know it drives people crazy. So people, like, you're not stressing over not having your truck? Nope. How are you going to get fixed? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It didn't start again like it did before. It just sit there until I can get it fixed. It didn't, you know. And, and, it, and it doesn't bother me. But drives some people nuts. I'm patient with God, you know. So he goes on. Doesn't brag. Is not proud or arrogant. I think that one's pretty self-explanatory. Is not rude. We'll leave that one alone. I like this one. Is not self-seeking. Let me ask you a question. When you get mad, do most of the time you get mad it's because you didn't get your own way? Or you're, you're not getting something you thought you wanted? Isn't it usually about us when we get mad? Isn't that usually when anger happens? There's times when it's righteous anger like Jesus and we're mad because of what the world's doing to Christians or we're mad at that. But I'm talking about that spontaneous. I'm not talking about that, that holy anger that comes over in you or thinking about a situation and it starts to, it starts to bubble and, and crock pot and you're, you start praying about something. I'm talking about that instantaneous, reactive anger that I didn't get my way. I think a big buzzword in our society today is offended. Yeah. We get offended. Yeah. By what someone said or by what we perceive that they said. Yeah. And I think that's where the church gets a lot of backlash from society mm -hmm. because they perceive us as being judgmental instead of loving. Mm -hmm. And it's you know, I, I, even in my own family, I am seeing this, and I'm saying I, I do not understand why you believe this, why you act this way. You know how I feel about this, but I will always love you, and I will always treat you with love. And anytime you want to talk, you can come to me, mm -hmm. and we'll talk about it. But otherwise, when you come to be with me, there will be love because I love you as a person. Mm -hmm. And but that's tough. It's, it's tough. Yeah. It's being that light. Say, but this is how you should live. Yeah, and in, This is what you should do, but then isn't that what the Pharisees did? That's what they this, did. This is what the but wall said. I, I'm beginning to be more onto the belief that I think the Holy Spirit wants us to do that sometimes. Because remember, Jesus went in to flip tables. Yes, but there was love first. There's always love. It's in an attitude of love. Yes. But he did flip tables. He did tell the Pharisees. That's why I say. He was tougher on the people who say that. Say there. Exactly. You, I and, am. and that's the whole point. 
I don't have the right to go out in the middle of the street and and do street preaching like it was back in the day where you get up, you're repent, repent, you're going to hell. I don't think that's beneficial in most places today because I don't have the right to do that. But if you tell me you're a Christian and we interact in Christian circles, then I, the Holy Spirit has every right to say, uh, you know, I'm studying chapter 13, love chapter here, and uh, lo- love. <laughs> and love says, you know, we shouldn't be, you know, self-seeking or rude or, or envious or not kind or not patient. Is this reaction any of those? And that's tough. But I can't go down the street and just pick a random person. You go to church? Nope. Hey, you're not showing love right now, buddy. Bible thumper. We're, we're chasing them away. But if I go give them some money to pay for gas at, at a gas station, or if I go do the landscaping and they ride by and go, what are these people doing? Oh, and what, what? On a Sunday? You're supposed to be in church doing your churchy thing, and you're out serving us that want nothing to do with the churchy thing? There's something different about you pink shirt wearing people. And then hopefully what happens when they have that crisis moment, because I always said this about the kids, there's going to be a day when you're down in your basement in the darkest corner and life is terrible and you're at your bottom. I hope something I've said will drive you to Christ. Hopefully something we do when we go out in the community will drive them to Christ. Whether it's that moment I think we should not only be praying for moments, I think we should be praying for salvations to happen that day. Because you talk about the testimony that would happen, the joy that should happen in the next service. How awesome would it be that pastor could stand up in the pulpit the week after and go, we had X amount of people give their life to Christ because we were doing this or that or we were here or we were there. That would be phenomenal. And how awesome would it be that maybe one or two of them showed up that week? Or we know that, hey, I have a friend that goes to Calvary and and we know for a fact that they went to Calvary. How awesome would it be? But if we're not praying that way and if we're not living that way and if we're not doing that and asking God to do that, God's sitting up there like, you did a good thing. But the impact was what? And God's going, it wasn't my fault that this didn't happen. It was ours. Because we didn't ask him to show pour forth his love and show his love through us this these ways. See, so we got love is not rude, love is not self seeking. It is not provoked nor overly sensitive and easily angered. That's provoked. Well, not going there, not saying nothing, but I guarantee you've seen that. God right here said that was not Christ-like. Your reaction, your attitude was not Christ-like. You allowed more of the enemy to get in the way you reacted than what you think should have happened. That's what the enemy does. Nope, not going there. Stopping there. That's all I'm going to say. It does not take into account a wrong endured. What someone else say on that at the end of 5? It says, keeps no record of wrongs. Keeps no record of wrongs. <laughs> yeah. I heard that off. Well, not that, but yeah. You've a You're f- like an elephant. You don't forget anything. You offended me. <laughs> they offended me. I didn't like what they were doing, and I'm going to hold that grudge for 50 years. That pastor in 1970 did this and I didn't like it and he was an idiot. That pastor last week did something he didn't like and he's an idiot. That friend, that loved one, that grocery clerk. I'm never going there again because they... They put my eggs on the bottom. Yeah. 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 Don't put all the cold stuff together. Yeah. And... And how easy is it for us to do that? Say it again. Say what? The phrase again. 
which yours says? It said, uh, keeps no record of wrongs. Keeps no record of wrongs. I'm not supposed to keep any record of the wrong that happened. So is this saying that we are then to follow God's example when we ask forgiveness? He threw our Do sins it away. far away. See, you. And so and it is hard. That's humanly possible. It, it, it isn't humanly possible, but it is Christ possible. Christ who lives within me. All things are possible through Christ the Holy Spirit within me the Holy Spirit wasn't given to us remember this is sandwiched between the gifts of God love gifts again the Holy Spirit was not given to me to do for him the Holy Spirit was given to me to be like him and that's different because everybody thinks the Holy Spirit was given to them to be a minister or to have the gift of healing or have the prophecy or be a teacher or be an apostle or go through any of that list the Holy Spirit was given to me so that I can be empowered to live like Christ because my flesh can't do it and so that I can become brighter light and more salty when he wants to use me because he tells me if I'm not salty throw it on the road because it's useless and if the batteries in my flashlight go dead my battery is useless. I am not lighting up anything. So, they reacted wrong. I've got to forgive them. And, and not worry no about it. And keep no record. They walk back into your life. To, I love you, man. I missed you. And listen to the Holy Spirit and what He tells you to do in that interaction. Because He still may cause you to check them. Hey, I'm just checking up on you, man. You know, I know you were a little upset last time. Is Have you worked through that anger? But He may, because He's all-knowing and wise, tell us to do exactly what the Father did. Throw it in the sea and forget. And love Him like nothing ever happened. It's hard. Because haven't you heard conversation after conversation? Do you know what they did in 1923? Ah, you know, and at the worst states, I'll never forgive them. Well, that's scary because Scripture tells us if they never forgive, Father doesn't have to forgive them. That's scary. Their salvation is in deep jeopardy. That's real scary. This is what I say. If we listen intently with every conversation when we go into, if we in, intentionally go into certain situations and listen to the Holy Spirit, we will hear little cues and little things and go through this list and go, there's a, there's a mustard seed happening that isn't of God. Because when someone goes, do you remember when brother or sister did this to us? Time out. No, I don't. Because I am being like Christ and being like the Father and I threw it into the sea and I forgot it. And God healed me of that so it's over with. And you hear those little conversations that happen and we've got to be in tune with the Holy Spirit. And, and He's going to go, check them. Love them. Get them through that seed that is planted and the enemy has at any moment he wants to do it. They've been hurt by the church they're still going to church, but the enemy has that seed in there that at any moment he wants to, disruption. I need to disrupt the church, so I'm going to, boom, bang. They remembered the wrong, and the enemy goes, gotcha. I can throw a wrench in this system right now anytime I want. That's the power of discipleship. That's the power of being loving followers of Christ for each other and being there for each other. People may check us and we may not like it initially, but we got to go. If we're true to Christ, we got to go. Okay, I don't, I didn't like that. And I think they're idiots right now, but Lord, is there any truth in that? And if there is, thank you for telling me that. And we don't like to do that. 
we'll just like push it under the rug, sweep it under the rug, and it'll all go away. And the enemy's like, I love it when you sweep stuff under the rug because I can always pick the rug up and go, you see what that? And that's what the enemy does in our lives, in our marriages, your marriages, I'm my marriage, in your family, at your job, in our country, in churches around the world. Sweep it under the rug. Don't get rid of it. Make sure you keep that offense. But we hear it. And if we hear it, Holy Spirit, I heard I heard an unloving statement. I, I hear pain. I hear hurt. I hear I hear this conversation. Am I supposed how, how can I help? Am I supposed to help them? Or am, am I supposed to let you do it? You hear it everywhere. And it's tough. Uh, it does not, verse 6, it does not rejoice in injustice, but rejoices with the truth when right and truth prevail. That's a good one. I like this next one. Love bears all things regardless of what comes. If we, if we are following Christ, There is nothing anybody can do to us to make us not love them. Could you read verse 7 again? The beginning of verse 7. Love bears all things, and the Amplified says, regardless of what comes. It probably says, like, bear, love endures all, or something like that. Mine says it always protects, always trusts, always hosts, always perseveres. And 7? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Regardless of what, mine says, love bears all things regardless of what comes, believes in all things, looking for the best in each one, hopes all things, remaining steadfast during difficult times, endures all things without weakening. But you think about it, love bears all things regardless of what comes, believes all things, looking for the best in each one. So at some point in our walk, we have to give everything to God. God, I didn't like that situation. God, I didn't like what I don't like what just happened in the conversation we just had. But I take it because I love Him. Now you've got to help me make sure I don't let that be a seed. Let let me sweep something under their rug. I love it. Bears all things, regardless of what comes. Believes all things, looking for the best in each one. Why did they react that way? Why do we react that way? There's an underlying issue. See, everything we say and do isn't just at that moment. When we speak, it's from the totality of the experience of our life. The totality of the experience that's happened to us. And we, we say what we feel based not necessarily on the moment. That is just the seed. It's based on the totality of our experiences. When we're talking, when they negatively talk about their father, that affects them through their whole life. Why? And they've got to get over it, or everything they base their decisions on, after that, is going to affect them. If they feel hurt, they're always going to feel hurt in certain situations. They didn't let me know enough, or they didn't tell me, yada, yada, yada. It's always going to come out. And we got to go. I went too far. Um... I think joy is the next one, whatever the next word is. So just, I think joy. Study joy. I see. Where am I at? Galatians, where are you at? Joy is the next one. So we'll talk about joy. If we get further than joy next week, we will or not. Um, I went too long. A few, few minutes, so. All right. Bye, Debbie.